Hi guys, welcome back to the workshop. Sorry it's been a while since I've done anything. Uh, it's been a bit busy, not really been spending too much time in the workshop. A uh, few bits on site and uh, been helping my parents out with a few bits in their house as well. So uh, been extra busy, long days and uh, just not really had a chance to film too much. Um, I actually filmed, I made and filmed this uh, a few, couple of months ago probably now. Um, just never got around to doing an introduction or getting it sorted and uploaded. So um, we're here now and we're going to do it. This is what we're making and we'll get stuck straight into it. Okay, so here I'm just uh, ripping the board down to width before I cross cut it to length. I'm doing this so that um, I can get the maximum amount of timber out of the board. Uh, the 100mm cuts that I'm making for the corner posts are a lot longer than the slats that I need for the uh, sort of panelling in the middle of the radiator cover. So if I rip it down first, I'm not wasting lengths of the off cut uh, of the timber. So uh, I can do the relative cross cut lengths after I've ripped it down. Okay, so now I'm going to rip the um, inch and a quarter tulip wood down um, into into half. So it's the 50 mil section left from ripping the boards, and I'm going to make the slats or the panelling pieces out of this uh, timber. So cutting it in half and planing all around, I'm going to end up with a, a piece about 13 mil wide, which uh, should be plenty thick enough for the uh, just to create that panelling section, the slats in the middle. Hopefully, it won't move too much. Alright, so we've planed up the uh, all the bits of timber that I need. Um, these are some, they were 100mm or meant to be. I think they finished like 96mm by 27 uh, tulip. So they're going to be the corner posts, same as the sideboard. So I'm, uh, I'm going to find some appropriate faces and edges. So that is a nice face. I'm looking at the front face, so that will be the front of the uh, that won't be the front because it's got a nasty nut there. So that'll be the front of the um, what's it bloody called that we're making? Radiator cover. And then uh, so I need a clean edges up these two corners here, so they've got to be nice and sharp. And also need a nice sharp edge along this back corner here, um, where the other board will join onto it, so that we can glue that on and get a nice tight glue line, and it look pretty seamless. So. Uh, they're what we're looking for in the, when we're setting out our face and edges. Um, so the edge will be inside of the cabinet, so we want to check the back edge corner for any imperfections. I'm going to lose this, there's a little nick here, it'll, it'll get cut off in the length, but uh, just uh, find, the, find the appropriate best faces. I'm going to lose that in the back edge in case I don't see it when I'm cutting them off to length and leave it in, it's uh, sort of foolproof then. So that will be a um, face and an edge um, for the side. That can be a side piece, I think. We'll do this one as a side piece. So that can be face, edge, side. We'll make that the top. So then this will be on the least visible side of the uh, radiator cover, it's got this streak in it, I don't want that to bleed through the paint and show up so we won't see that ever. So that'll make this one, this is the top, and we're left with two face pieces here. So like I say, we want a nice clean back edge, so that can be one, that can be two. So now I can uh, glue these together, make some corners up. So if we call this number one, and this one number two, that will make this the top. So we've got a pair with a top orientation. So. Got a side here and the top. 
So that will be joined onto this one, so that will be number two. So uh, I'm just going to domino them together. So I'll sit that one against there and tick some appropriate lines down. I can uh, stick some dominoes in there and uh, join that together. Same again on this piece. So face is the inside of the radiator cover, so we're working off this back edge for the joint. And then the face is seen, so we can tick the lines on there. And when you're dominoing these together, I know it says in the instructions to do one tight and then the rest loose um, fit. So you, you do a tight setting in all of these. And then on the opposite piece, you do one tight one to locate and then the rest loose. Um, you can do that. I find as you know, if, you, if you're pretty accurate with what you're doing, you don't need to, and you get a better joint if they're all tight throughout. So uh, there's enough play in the edge of the domino. They've got like a slightly pointed edge that if it needs to just pull slightly one way, it will do to get them dominoes into place. So uh, I usually just do them tight for this type of application. Okay, so we'll uh, glue them up now that they're uh, been joined together. Find some dominoes. If we're gluing them like this, like a, a thin piece to a to a wider piece like that around the corner, um, it's always best to have a long backer piece or something with a bit of strength that's nice and straight to uh, clamp against the uh, thinner piece, so you don't get like a a wobble where the uh, clamps are and then where there's not a clamp there's no pressure being applied so it's like a backing board or in this case if you're doing two you can use the two long, two long pieces back to back and glue both up at the same time which is what I'm going to do. Plenty of glue because we're not worried about uh, glue squeeze on this job. So we need to spread the glue around the domino. I'd always, um, if you're ever using PU glue, uh, try and use some gloves. I mean, it comes with gloves in the box, which is sort of a ominous sign that it's not very good for your health uh, if something comes it's supplied with the safety equipment with the product. Um, so just take heed of that. I mean, it says on any polyurethane sort of glue or adhesive product or foam, it says on the case that it's uh, a known carcinogen. So. I'm guessing it's uh, skin cancer, maybe it's a vapour thing as well uh, with the polyurethane sort of expanding foam you don't want to be breathing it in but uh, it's dead easy to get it on your skin and uh, it just sets on, onto your skin and sort of welds to it so the only way to get it off your hands then is to sort of remove the layer of skin it's glued to so um, yeah I'd always recommend you wear protective gloves to help you uh, stop getting it on your hands would be ideal. We'll be having skin grafts later on in life if not. That's number one. Put that together. Put the two glued up quickly. The glue's going off quick today. I've only started using PU glue in the last uh, couple of years and I'm a bit of a convert really. I mean I, I never really rated it much. We trialled it at an old joinery shop where I did my training and uh, it's good for some things. Um, there we, we sort of never really got on with it and never found it that great but uh, I've sort of learned to work with it. I mean the, uh, the introduction of a coir was the main point at which is like right I've got to make this work because uh, I can't use cascomite on a coir, and cascomite was sort of the traditional glue that I trained with and used an awful lot of. I mean, if you're going to glue something up, it was either contact adhesive, white glue, 
or cascomite, and cascomite was, was sort of a joinery adhesive. So um, that's what I started with, and uh, I've learned the trade using. So go into PU glues. I mean, it's quite a different product, really, um, but it's bloody brilliant now. I've got used to it and uh, found methods that work with it. Um, still not sort of 100% there. Replacement. I mean, if you've got a complicated door you're gluing up, uh, PU glue is bloody hard work because uh, it's, it's gone off before you've got the door together. So I've not found a solution for that one yet. I mean, that's the point at which you have to use an alternative if you're using a coil like a the Type Bond 3, which is a aliphatic resin, but it's a really slow setting version of. Um, aliphatic resin so it, uh, it sort of takes quite a few hours to go off which uh, gives you uh, a sort of a nice open pot time, pot life to uh, actually get things together. Um, whereas PU glue, I think the slowest setting one I've come across is sort of 20 minutes you've got to work on it and uh, it's just not enough for some jobs. So. Um, while it's great, it's not suitable for everything, um, but I'd be lost without it now. Uh, jobs like this where you sort of, I want to make this today in the day and try and get it painted as well, all in the same day. Um, using cascomite and things, especially in the winter, it just wouldn't happen. Whereas uh, PU glue, you clamp something up and if, uh, if you forget to do something, you glue another bit together and it's dry within uh, within 10 minutes and you can start working on it so it's bloody lovely stuff for that respect and uh, curved work it's a godsend because uh, you can sort of cut a straight joint in something clamp it together with the glue and then uh, run grooves in it and set uh, loose tenons in from the outside after it's set together so you almost make the joints um, after you've glued it together and it's quick enough that you can do that. So I've found there's quite a uh, quite a variation in PU glues. Um, I mean they're all pretty different. Some set really sort of fast and without too much expansion. Uh, different colours. Some are quite brown. Some are white. Um, some just keep foaming forever. Uh, the stuff in the bottles is a bit different. Again, it seems softer initially so it's easier to clean off um, but they all set the same hardness eventually I mean the stuff in the bottle after a week is as hard as the stuff that you've used out of a tube um, it just takes a little bit longer to get there so, um, yeah it's, it's pretty good stuff I mean, the one I'm using at the minute uh, is a Sovereign it's called PU Rapid um, Seem to get on quite well with it. I know other people that say they don't don't like it and prefer the other one that Sovereign Cell, which is a, a burner wood adhesive. Um, been working on a building site where they use the uh, lumberjack, which I think is ever build stuff, um, and that's different again to this. The, uh, the lumberjack wood adhesive, you know, you put that on something, clamp it up, it's set rock hard in about five minutes, whereas this will take. I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to get to that stage where it's a similar sort of hardness on the foam. Um, and it takes maybe a week to get really rock hard. So that uh, foamed edge there, for that to get really hard, takes it a, a quite a while. Whereas the Everbuild stuff seems to just, just go instantly. It's quite good. Um, quite good, a quick adhesive if you're, you're building things on site. You can uh, quickly get stuff made. So. Sort of a trial and error really, if you're looking for the ideal glue, there isn't one. Um, it's sort of finding the one that works for you and the right application and the only way to do that is to try and persevere with it. Like I said, uh, we um, we trialled PU glue years ago and never got on with it, but uh, I've sort of forced myself to make it work and I wouldn't be without it now, so uh, it's worth sticking out some things like that. Okay, so while the corner post is setting, um, I'll just quickly cut the rails off the length. Um, if you've got a bit of extra length than you need, then you can uh, lose any waste as normal.
So when you're cutting them uh, rails off, if you're doing like the domino method, and it's uh, shaker style with no groove in the joint, so it's a perfectly flush joint, you want to be checking your timber, almost put your face marks on before you cut them off so you know your face um, edge and you can put that so that the, key, uh, the teeth of the cross cut can cut into it so you get a really nice crisp line. What you don't want to do is have this as your face and uh, I don't know if it will show up on the camera. Get all this uh, sort of blow out on the back edge where the cross cut has, uh, has cut the wood and come through the other side. I mean a zero clearance insert will help with this but it's never as clean as it is on the uh, front edge here. If you've got like a scoring cutter on a decent table saw, it will help, but you've still got, to, uh, it's still gonna put like 0.1 of a mil more of a cut there and sort of show up in your paint, I think so. Um, you're always best having the face as the, uh, the inside of the, where the teeth cut. So just pay attention to that and, uh, and make sure that side is up when you're cutting on the cross cut. Again, just uh, face and edge marks on these. Um, bearing in mind that we're going to lose bits of this uh, behind on the inside of the cabinet so you can hide quite a lot of any imperfections, not that we've got too many. There we go. Right, so uh, now comes the long task of setting these out. So we've got um, 11 uprights here that I'm going to uh, domino into these. Um, I think I'm going to paint them first, paint everything and then uh, glue this together as a winner uh, pre-painted but uh, and then perhaps give it one coat after it's all been glued together just to just to finish it off in case there's any marks but uh, yeah so I think I'm going to, going to do it that way and uh, just have a and not seal the edges so if I'm ever painting anything I normally put like a, a corner sealant like a joint sealant around any corners and internal joints but uh, it's been quite difficult to seal it on all of these because they're quite close together so I think painting first is, is the best option so I'm going to domino it and uh, make it up as a frame like that. So i got to set this out. So we've got a 20mm or roughly 20mm gap um, but to wipe that out We've got 11 slats at 50 mil. So 11 times 50 is 550. Check that maths out. And then we've got uh, 245 mil. They're not right on that. And there's 11 pieces, I think. Yeah, so we've got uh, 11, 12 gaps. So we divide that by 12. Um, let's get a calculator. Oh, that's two, isn't it? Two, four, five, divided by 12. 20.416. 416. Right. What would it be if it was uh, with 12 slats, not uh, 11? So it'll be 245 minus 50 for another slat. 195 divided by 13. It's 15 mil gaps. 20 mil or 15 mil? Ooh. Only one way to find out, isn't there? Decisions, decisions. Hardest part of the job is making decisions like this. What's going to look right? So 20, 20. I mean, I'm favouring 20 at the minute purely because it's a bit less work. What do we reckon? Can you see that? So that's 15. I bet 20 is going to look a bit wider, isn't it? Like that. I think I'm going to go 15. Right. So let's check that mess. Check it's right. 795 minus uh, 1250s is 600. Minus 600 divided by 13 gaps is 15 mil. Right, OK. 
Okay. So if we find the, uh, I don't need to mark out because I'm using the domino, I'll put one domino in the center of each slat. I'm not gonna mark out the gap spacings for each piece. I'll just put the center lines on there. So I can mark the edge one as 15 and then we're going 50, so 65. So I'll know the center of that then is uh, 40 mil, is it? Is that right? 65. Yeah, 40 mil. A bit off with my pencil line there. So 40 mil in from each end is the centre of the first slat. And then from that point on, they're 65 mil apart. So 65, 130, uh, two, uh, 195. So 295, 5, 750, and we are left with 65mm. So they're my uh, centre points. I can uh, set my domino now. So um, what I'm going to do is set them just 10mm back from the face of that uh, piece of timber. So it looks something like that. So uh, I think I've got enough depth. I think a domino will do 30 mil deep. So they are 13. What's going to look right? Again, a bit of trial and error on what's going to look right. Don't want too big of a flat that it looks looks a bit dodgy. But uh, the deeper it is, I think the more quality it looks because it's made from thicker materials. Let's go for that. What's that measure? 12 mil. Let's go 11 mil. So, we want to set our domino in this to 11 plus half of that, so six and a half. So, um, what's that? 17 and a half, isn't it? Yeah. yeah let's do that. 11, 17 and a half. 17 and a half on that, and then six and a half in this. And then let's see what that looks like in a scrap piece. I'm gonna go a bit less. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce that down to 10. I think it looks, uh, looks a bit too heavy. Reduce that down to 10 and uh, I think that'll be about right. Okay, so next I'll uh, cut the 12 of these off um, to the height of this, uh, this section here. So it's, um, it's between the uprights and the uh, the rails where they fall against the bevel of this at the same height as the sideboard. So uh, it's 690mm from the drawing. So I'll, I'll set the saw at 690mm and uh, again I'm looking for the nice face to keep upright and that will be my face and uh, I can cut it so you get a nice clean cut at the end and then domino it without having to worry about them burrs affecting the domino position. Okay, back on the saw, 690mm, you've not got one of these, barely get one, brilliant. Checking for the best face, we've got a bit of damage here, that wants to be on the back edge, this is our nice face. 
and square an end, move it along to the stop, and it's done. Cut. Okay, so uh, just stick a domino in the ends of all them now. Uh, need to set it to the middle, so six and a half uh, millimetres. Definitely not going to forget to do that. And then uh, I'm going to domino first, then I'm going to take all the sharp edges off on the spindle. Just a very gentle uh, round, sort of a one, maybe two mil diameter round on there. Um, I'm going to do that after I've dominoed them because the domino's got like a nice gauge on it to uh, to centre the piece of timber and if you've got a round on there it's quite difficult to uh, to centralise it uh, so it's just making my life a bit easier. Right, so I've not got a, uh, a tiny tiny yeah, like two mil radius bit, you probably need to buy one for the spindle. Because it's such a small amount, uh, you could almost get away with a flat, just like a rebater on a 45 degree. But uh, I've got a 10 mil radius, actually no, it's an 8 mil radius bit here, so I'll uh, I'll just use that in the centre and take it off. So it sort of takes 2 mil off the corner, and it will give the appearance of a very small radius on the edge. Um, especially by the time you've sanded it and run sandpaper over it and painted it a few times and the edge, uh, you can have a nice rounded edge on there at that sort of radius. So, it's not too essential that you've got the exact right cutter for that job. So, uh, this is this is the original block I bought when I first started out with my little jet spindle moulder. A tiny little CMT block, uh, almost like a hobby block, but uh, it's steel construction. But um, if you tighten these wedges up too much, so if you just give it a decent tweak to hold the cutters in like I did when I first got it. It, uh, it actually distorts the block very slightly and it doesn't go on the spindle. Um, it must compress this and distort it and uh, just pinches the, uh, the shaft of the spindle moulder. So uh, if you've got one of these and uh, you see that as a problem or you do the cutters up while it's on the actual spindle moulder and you can't get it off, that's the reason why. Just take this uh, pedal off here that I've put on. said before like the spindle moulder you have to build the collars up until uh, they get closer so that uh, the top hat washer here it's got like a, a slight indent so the top washer has to stick proud of that top of that spindle shaft um, otherwise it seats down onto the uh, top of the spindle shaft and doesn't hold the washers so in, in effect it clamps like that and they can still spin so uh, you have to be just a bit careful that you put enough clearance in. What I like to do is have a, a tool washer at the top rather than having a tool washer to get it flush and then adding a small spacer one on top that could get off centered. So uh, if you end up in that situation, just turn them around and uh, put a tool washer that's gonna bridge the gap uh, quite safely. doesn't need to be too tight so almost just over the length of that sort of six seven inch bar it's just a just enough to push it tight that's all you need you know it's a tweak you know you don't need to rip that up tight because it's never going to come undone I mean if you're new to it as well just just keep the machine isolated until you're absolutely certain it's uh, it's safe and good to go and then just work all your settings back. So uh, start with a scrap piece that's square. Doesn't need to be the exact same piece. Um, it could be anything as long as it's square or as long as it's the same shape as what you're going to be moulding. And uh, you can just work that cutter. So judge it to the sort of centre where it's roughly going to be. And uh, you can your centre line of the spindle at 90 degrees to the fences is the deepest part of the cut on the circle of the cutter. So uh, it's not when the cutter's straight, it's uh, it's when it's slightly, well it's when it's at a, the right angle so that the centre of the cut 
is in that cutter from the centre of the shaft. Now when you're doing profile matching and stuff like that, it can make a very slight difference. You might think, well, it's the perfect cutter when it's held 90 degrees to the profile, but that's not how the cutter cuts, because they, they have that sort of, it's probably 30 degree angle on them at their furthest point out in the cut. So it's worth bearing in mind if you, if you want to be really accurate, if you're dialing in some cutters to get the perfect molding. Um, or big cutters, like a, something that's doing a profile that could be 30 mil deep, that starts to play more of an effect of, as it would if it was a, just an arrow molding like this, where it's maximum 10 mil depth. So um, it's worth bearing in mind if you if you're cutting any profile cutters of your own or grinding them that they do cut at that angle. And just work it back so. I can see that's sort of engaging the cutter there and it's that's where it's going to be at its deepest point so I can bring my fences forward to that point and uh, lock them off and uh, I can then turn the machine on and just slowly work back until uh, I get the, the cut depth I need and I sort of know, know how far I'm going to be travelling back so I can set these far enough away that uh, I know they're not going to be interfered with by moving that machine. Test uh, spin, make sure everything's uh, clear and uh, fire up. sanded them all and just took the edges off with some denibbing paper. That'll be a perfect little round over for all them. And it, uh, it's just a nice accurate way of doing them all exactly the same. So when you're uh, setting up the power feed, so what I'm looking for is when I'm setting the um, angle, I bring the head round. I want it so that back of the power feed is uh, closer to the fence than the front uh, by about 10 mil. It depends on what you're moulding. If you've not got 10 mil of room on your moulding to do it, you want at least some uh, toe in, toe out of the uh, power feeder. So it, as it's drawing the book through, it's pushing it against this fence and it's, uh, it's not been allowed to float away from it. So you just need a slight bit of angle to pull it in. Uh, it doesn't need to be too drastic, so 10 to 15 mil is about perfect. Over the length of this machine, obviously a narrow one, you don't want to switch the gap to that. So we lock that off. bit around the camera. Um, always keep it as close to the fence as I can, unless it's uh, tiny mouldings that are likely to dip in some bed or anything like that. Um, you just got to play it by ear on that one. And then height-wise, usually get the piece of timber that I'm going to be moulding, drop the wheels down and then hold it alongside. I'm looking for about uh, a five or six mil lower than the piece of wood. I'm going to be moulding somewhere around there so that you know that the uh, spring on the wheels is going to be putting tension down on the timber but you don't want too much tension um, you're getting problems with uh, trying to feed these pieces of timber through it's going to be two things it's either going to be the beds have got gummed up and they need some uh, machine wax on them to help it slide through or you've got too much pressure on the power feeder and it's just forcing it into the cast iron the bed or the aluminium and uh, there's not enough forward power it'll just slip on the wheels against the amount of friction you're putting with the force of the, uh, of the power feeder so um, obviously if it's too loose and not putting enough pressure to feed it through that could be a problem as well or incorrect setup of the fences if everything's running through smoothly and then it starts failing it's uh, it's going to be the machine wax on too much pressure. Okay, so just uh, scraped the glue off the corner post and uh, chiselled it out the inside corner so it's nice and clean. I'll give it a quick sand. Um, 
and fill any, if there's any gaps or anything in this joint line, I'll, I'll just squeeze a little bit of filler in there and uh, cut it off to length and set the uh, rails out for the dominoes. Okay, so now they're cut to length, I can uh, set them out. So we've got a pair here of uprights. So this is the top. I'll stick a clamp on them actually. Okay, so um, what have we got 50 mil upright. 50 mil on the top. So 50 mil rail, uh, domino in the centre at 25. And from the bottom, I've got 120 mil to the top, top of the bottom rail. Then a 50 mil uh, gap underneath, vent gap for where the plinth is. Um, it's the same gap on the sideboard. So that distance in between them two should be equal to these rails here, which it is, it's spot on. So they're the right length. Um, and we'll put a domino in here, uh, in the centre again, because it's not got a groove. 35. Um, we can domino these central, central uh, marks, don't need to mark it any further, uh, with a 10 by 50 and uh, a 10 by 50 in the ends of these two rails. And uh, that's pretty much all the jointing done for the uh, for the domino wise. Got to join the top on and do a little shadow gap, but uh, that should be all the cutting done from that point. I'll change the cutter in the domino. Should just buy another one really, so I could have one one with each size cutter in, so I'm not going to keep changing the cutter. But uh, I did recently just change it to, to a new one. I had my last one about seven years. Um, and a, a good offer came up on eBay, so uh, they're doing a hundred pound cash back at the minute. And eBay did a twenty percent off promotion through uh, FFX, so uh, up to a hundred quid discount. So I got a hundred pounds off the the new one through eBay, and a hundred pound cash back from Festool for buying Domino um, as well. Uh, so it's basically two hundred quid off the new price. Um, Bargain, really, and I managed to sell my old one. It cost me about 60 quid to go from a seven year old domino to a brand new one with a warranty, so uh, pre pretty chuffed with that. Should have bought two, really, though. No? Right, so there are my marks that I'm working to set that to the center, so 27 mil, I'll we'll go 25, so it's a bit nearer the face. The Hoover in. Okay, so I'm at a point now where I probably need to start gluing up. So I'm just going to sand these edges of the two rails. Uh, I'm going to leave the uprights. Um, I might, I might just put sand that gently and spray that edge as well on the corner post. And I'm going to sand and spray paint all the um, slats uh, enough to get them to a decent finish level perhaps needing one more coat um, then I'm going to glue it all together and uh, sand and paint it like I would normally and it just means I've not got to denib all these slats while they're in place 
in a big frame I can uh, I can just do them individually um, and it's a lot easier to work with them like that so I'm going to do that stage now and then uh, while the paint's drying I can work on the top and the shadow gap. Okay, so you've probably seen me mention it before but uh, anyway you've got a joint running into a sanded surface um, I'd use a, a flat backing pad uh, with your sandpaper on it and then just be really careful to keep that nice and flat to take them planar ridges out. Um, if you use a sort of orbital sander you, uh, you're going to round that edge over on the edges there and get a V in your joint and that will show through on the paint. So uh, I like to use a backing pad, it gives a, a much better finish. If you're sanding like these slat edges here, um, they're 30 mil thick, so they're pretty difficult to stick in the vice or whatever and sand them originally. They just vibrate all over the place with the sander. So uh, I like to just have them on like this carpet mat, uh, bloody handy for everything really, but something like this where you might have a tiny variation in thickness in each piece, but each piece could be allowed to sort of raise up and down with the you know the pile of the carpet it's got a bit of give in it uh, if you stick a orbital sander on here and, and push down it sort of it will sand every piece at once um, rather than doing it on a hard surface where it only sands the slightly thicker ones or bits with raised edges etc so uh, doing it on a, a carpet backer like this is ideal um, and you want to just do enough pieces a that you can comfortably hold but you don't want them to go wider than the edges of the, the pad so if you were to do all them at once it's a bugger to hold like that but it will catch these edges so the, anywhere the pad runs onto the material and you, and you go left to right over them gaps it will catch them and sort of it will wreck your, your pad on your machine so uh, just enough so that it, it can cover it in the one pass and uh, just work your way along and it, it works a treat. It's dead quick as well because you're sanding six at once. Um, takes no time at all. Okay, so the first side of them is dry. So one side's not painted, we've just got two edges and the face uh, that's been painted. So all I do uh, before I do a proper denib on the sander is just denib these uh, the sides or the edges of the, the piece of wood I'm painting. Like so, normally with the extractor fan on so I've not got any dust that I'm breathing in. And it just takes it from like a really rough edge to a very nice smooth finish in not a lot of effort and uh, it's a bit of a key for the next coat and then uh, I'll paint them this way up doing the same process again so spraying that edge I've just denibbed and spraying the side that's not got any paint on yet and it's laying flat so you can put a tiny bit more paint on that edge. Okay, so one last thing I nearly forgot to put on there before gluing it together. Wouldn't have been the end of the world, I could have just trimmed it off, but uh, easier to do it now. Is uh, the bevel on the bottom of the feet at the front to match the sideboard. So, let's mark it out. Then we're going to have to cut it on this back edge because uh, I'm not going to be able to get anything else on the saw. If I mark this top side, I'm not going to be able to cut it very accurately. Seven. 
Okay, so I've got a Chinese takeaway coming, it's on the way. Uh, so I thought I'd quickly try and get this glued together. Just what you don't want to do is put yourself under pressure while you're trying to glue something up, but uh, needs must. So I'm just going to put glue in the joints of the uh, dominoes. I'm not going to put any on the uh, faces. It's not going to need a lot of glue. Just enough to hold it together, really. It's only a radiator cover. I'm putting in the glue uh, towards the back of the uh, domino so that any glue squeeze uh, will come out of the joint at the back, not at the front where you see it. If you hear that bell going, that's the Chinese arriving, so uh, I'm out of here. When you're trying to uh, locate loads of different uh, rails into a, a second component like that, uh, it's good to just lift them up into the mortise and then tap it down rather than get them all seated one side and then try and drop that top rail on. Um, if you can work each one up into it and have a little wig wiggle room, it uh, helps you locate them. I'm just going to clamp this up while I glue the ends. Actually, I might just leave that clamped and then uh, let that go off and then uh, glue the ends up another day. Just check these uh, these two faces aren't being distorted by the clamps, like that. Just check this side. It's not too bad. I'll just stick a square uh, tape on the corners to check the square. Pretty good. Should be pretty good. If you source cutting square, generally things will end up square. Um, and if everything you're making is out of square, then have a look at your kit. Make sure it's cutting right. I'll let that go off, and then we'll glue the sides on. Okay, so I've just clamped them uh, these pieces on here to the rails, so that they remain. Uh, true across the length of them so when I glue the uh, the corner posts on um, the joints are going to be nice and straight these aren't going to be skewed up and have a uh, an angle on the joint of some sort so um, it's good practice to keep them square but you can see it's uh, it's paid off pre-painting them there's not going to be any um, denibbing and sanding in between them, uh, them little slats so uh, all it's going to need is a, is a waft over one coat with the gun. Well, after I've done a couple of coats on this to get rid of the, uh, the grain rays, uh, one pass over everything should give me a, a really nice finish on it. So uh, it's well worth the effort uh, doing that first hand. Okay, so now it's just a case of gluing the corner posts on. Wank, that's the wrong way around, isn't it? Good job of paying attention. I've done a bit of a notch out here. It's a bit rough, I cut it out with a multi tool, but uh, that will be to notch over where the valve sticks out the side of the radiator, and I've not got a, uh, a lot of room between the nested tables that I've decided to put next to it. So I've notched it down to about 5mm, that's as thin as I'd go. There's about a 10mm gap, so should give us plenty of clearance between the valve and the uh, tables. Looks a bit like a radiator cover. Whenever you're setting clamps on anything, make sure that they're parallel along the piece that you're clamping so it doesn't try to pull it out of square. I'm just going to run a straight edge here over a length of them there. Uh, uprights to make sure that they're staying flat and not tipping either way because um, that's going to look awful against that uh, shadow gap. 
Okay, so while the glue dries on the frame, um, have a little think about how I'm going to fit it. I'm going to use some French cleat so I can take the radiator cover off and on quite quickly. So it'll literally drop into place and if I need access to the radiator for tweaking the thermostat or a leak or something like that, it literally just lifts off and you've got instant access. So French cleats are about the best way of doing that. I'm not going to go into uh, French cleats too much, that's a whole other video. But um, what I'm going to show you for this one is that uh, I like to put some 5mm domino grooves in one of the cleats, so the one on the uh, on the item you're hanging on the wall. And uh, pretend this is the uh, the one that's on the wall, and this is your radiator cover. So this cleat will be screwed to the to the cover here, and seat on the other cleat with a uh, pan head screw, so a flat headed screw, so you're not distorting this, and you can move it in small increments. Um, and if it doesn't touch the floor, the feet aren't touching the floor by say 5mm, you can uh, undo the screw slightly, lift that cleat up and re-clamp it down and you've got a really good adjustment method there um, until you get it spot on because uh, French cleats are, are quite difficult to get an exact mounting height because any distance this way that you've scribed the cabinet into the wall, if it's not perfectly flush with the back, it's going to affect the, uh, the height of the cabinet. So. Um, for example, the further that is off, the more it moves up, and the nearer to the back of the cabinet is, the more it drops down. So it's very easy for them to end up slightly skew with cleats, and uh, putting a groove in like that with a panhead screw or a washer under a screw will uh, help you adjust that sort of very finely and get it right. And then when you're done, drill a pilot hole through both pieces um, and just pop a screw in there so there's no movement anymore. And then that'll allow you to just lift your radiator cover off and uh, and have instant access. Okay, so quickly clean the glue off and sand the uh, main joints of the cover. Okay, so to uh, create the shadow gap like the uh, sideboard, it's got some 9mm plywood and uh, I've cut it 9mm short both directions. I'm just going to uh, fit that in in line with this joint here so it looks like the corner post is solid but been rebated by the 9mm. And then uh, I've just took the angle off at the back here so that if I have to do any scribing on this back edge I've not got a big piece of plywood that I need to scribe in too. So uh, there's enough room there to get a couple of fixings through to fix the top in. Uh, once it's glued in place and uh, I can glue and pin them on. Then in the middle I'm just going to have a look now um, and see with the top on. I've not cut the top to size yet. Let's drop the camera down. So I don't want to put a piece of plywood in the centre to support the centre. So if I just uh, imitate that with this piece. I think you'll see it once it's all painted and brightly lit. I think you're going to see it and catch your eye. Um, so I'm undecided whether to leave it at the same 10mm gap, maybe with a bit of a, a 45 degree bevel on it, or leave it square, or whether to, uh, to set it back so that uh, there's a thicker block um, in line with the back of the rail here. So it just looked like the shadow gap was all the way along and you didn't see that gap. So I'm not really convinced as to which one I'm going to do. I think that potentially looks better with uh, if I screw this to the back of this rail and then put a pocket hole in this and uh, screw through the pocket hole into this top so that it's uh, set back. I think that's going to be the best option. Dear, I've not got enough air pressure at the minute. Okay, so just centre that up in the opening. I think it's 135mm piece that I'm using. Leaves us with uh, 855, 47.5. Both ends. Just get it right, 
Turn them over. Real quick. Drop of glue. Or a drop of dew, whichever you prefer. Because the other pieces are uh, bit plywood, you can use a uh, plywood packer. I'm seating the screw without a pilot hole. Um, usually just like to run it backwards uh, to let it find its own position before I screw it in. If you just screw straight in without running it backwards, it can tend to hit the grain and, and sort of dive in off centre, whereas running it backwards seems to turn it in the uh, pilot hole here and create a true centre for it to drive into. You shouldn't really be driving without a uh, pilot hole anyway, but uh, if you do, it's a good little technique. Glue this end on. With the light uh, shining through behind, you can just see that support piece in the middle, but uh, I think when it's on a wall and you've got no light showing through, I think it's going to be pretty much invisible, so uh, I think that's the right option. I'll cut the top to size, give everything a light sand and, uh, and get it painted. Okay, so I'm at the house now, um, everything's all painted, so uh, get to work installing the cover, see if it fits. Okay, so first thing I'm seeing is the floor's not very level, and uh, it's going to need scribing around the skirting, so uh, I'm just going to set up a scribing tool to sort that out. Okay, so to scribe this gap back here, um, I'm going to push it, seat it back at the bottom where it's going to go and uh, basically stick a level on the face here, get it level which is going to be about 22mm and then pack the uh, pack the top off tight here so I can push against it so it holds it level once 1mm less than that just check it again. Maybe a little, tiny bit less than that. So uh, it's worth spending some time getting this right. There we go. And then uh, set your scribing tool to the uh, widest gap. Now, if you're trying to keep it parallel to something like floor tiles, you'll have to set the radiator parallel to the floor tiles and set the scribing tool to the biggest gap on both sides of the cover so that you take both amounts off equally and it will go back parallel with the tiles. Um, I'm not really governed by anything here and uh, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, side to side it's only 20mm uh, or so of skirting and it looks pretty straight so I'm just going to do it, work off each side individually but uh, like I said if you want to keep it running with some tiles or straight with something you've got to set it up straight and level both sides set this to the widest gap and then uh, scribe it down. So I'm just going to do that now. So 
awesome. A scribing tool is a Veritas log scribe. Um, and using an in indelible pencil because it marks the paint a lot better than just a normal pencil but don't get it wet because it, it runs blue when it gets wet so make sure you remove any lines or we'll have some wipes handy um, after you finish so it doesn't leave blue stain on any of your work and just uh, you can run that in through the skirting and uh, all the way up the wall just to check that your scribe is perfect to the wall. So we've got a tiny bit off at the bottom here against the wall, about three mil at the top, and then obviously the skirting amount there. So to do any horizontal cuts like that, I would just uh, run a level through and tick it and just cut slightly above the line. There we have it, hopefully you can see the uh, lines there I'll try and take the camera off and show you. Okay so hopefully it uh, it will focus at that sort of distance. So that's my line there so my packers are holding it level set the compass to the furthest point and uh, described it in so we're getting a tiny little bit off at the bottom here then obviously the skirting board at the at the very bottom. I'll go and cut that now. Okay, so let's give that a try after we've scribed it in. That looks pretty good to me. Check it on the level. Perfect. Check this end. That's spot on. Okay, so the scribe's done. Now we need to dismount the uh, French cleats. So, um, I'm just going to put a very gentle line at the top here, something I can rub off the wall later, either side. That will give me the outside of the timber. Um, and then I'll measure the thickness of this timber, well I know it's 27mm. So if I come in, give myself a little bit of a gap, I'll come in about 28.5mm, 29mm. Put another line on there. Same on the other side. And then carry them lines through level again. That's giving me a outside measurement, or the that's where I'm going to put my French cleat. So the outside of the French cleat will be there, and the cleat will sit in here, and then I know the radiator cover will sit over it. So I'm just going to mount the uh, the French cleats on the wall, making sure I've got enough height, so I'm going to take a rough measurement of the height so that they fit on the radiator cover, put them on the wall, measure that, screw them to the radiator, and then that's it, pretty much finished. Right, so the cleat on the wall doesn't want to be any higher than 700. So that is my max height. Right, so I'm going to pilot drill the French cleat with a 5mm bit. So I'm using the ones with the ply going across, because that's where the strength in the ply is, through this way. Let's give it an accurate mark. So it's pretty good on 700. So I'll just drop it down slightly from that mark there, and come inside that line that I need to be inside of. Let's drill through, see what we find. Okay, so we've got a cavity, which is good. I'm going to use some little uh, star uh, board fixings here, so they just push into the cavity. You're meant to have a tool that you then cramp and it opens these uh, four star nuts up that spread behind the plasterboard and uh, hold it in place, but uh, normally you can get away with just tightening them up with the screw and it, uh, it pulls it in. Let's see if that'll fit through that hole. Okay, so you can see when they seat because they pull the fixing into the plasterboard. Take that off, put the uh, cleat back on, and then mark the other hole. Okay, 
and then just uh, screw them into place. Be careful with plasterboard, it doesn't need an awful lot of uh, strength to fix it. It's not a huge amount of strength in the board, so it's just enough to nip it up tight. You can use a, a fix all adhesive on the back of it as well if you want to make doubly sure it's going nowhere, but um, I know it's not going to be subject to any abuse here, so that's going to be more than strong enough to hold the, the thing on the wall. I mean, it's going to lean against the wall as it sits naturally, so it's more of a thing to just stop it falling over if you knock it. So uh, there's not any strength really needed in that fixing, it's just something to hold it there. So um, repeat that for the other side, inside them lines, then we'll screw the other French cleat onto the radiator cover. Okay, so for putting the French cleat on the uh, radiator cover, I'm just going to measure down from the from a reference point to the top of the skirting because I know that cut was tight. Uh, put the cleat in place and then uh, either tick a line on this or measure to this point here. So we've got 588 um, and then I'm just going to allow a couple of mil because it's going to be away from the wall very slightly to allow it to pull the radiator cover back. So the radiator cover is the bit that seats against the wall and not the cleat. So I'm going to go 590 from that reference point. So let's mark our position at uh, 590 mil. Square that over crudely. And I need to put this cleat on so that it sits this way around so that um, it will sit there somewhere like this. And uh, the cleat that's on the wall will then engage into this and hold the radiator cover back. So I've got a couple of panhead screws somewhere. So panhead screws um, so that when they seat into this uh, slot they don't create a V um, so I can move it. If I need to make any adjustments it's easy to move without uh, it falling back into that groove that it's made if you used like a uh, countersunk head screw. So remember we're going to this inside line to our reference point and just keep it in so there's a slight step against the back of the frame. Uh, we'll go in the centre of the slot so we've got plenty of adjustment. Create a bit of a pilot hole by running it backwards. And uh, tighten her up. Keep that nice and parallel so that the, the 45 degree faces mate nicely. at the top. And then we'll give it a test fit. If it's too high, we can adjust this to suit. Okay, so it, uh, this one is too high and that one's very just too high, so this one's about two, three mil high, the right hand side is about one mil too high. So I'll uh, take this off, I'll show you on this one a bit easier, let's put a little uh, reference mark on it first. So I know where I am. So I'm having to sort of keep out of the way, it's a bit awkward, I'm not as controlled. So it could be. That was uh, dead easy to move. If that was a countersunk screw, it had just pulled it back into the same position. And the same on this side. And uh, give it another try. Very nearly there, there's still a tiny bit of wobble because um, it's seating on the ground as well as the cleat, not just hanging off the cleat. Um, you've got to go some sort of very fine increments to get to the point where it's perfect. It's, it's about half a millimetre that side, and about half a mil on the right to be fair. So keep moving them until they're nice, seat nice and tightly, pull it back, and it's sitting on the floor. Okay, so uh, one more attempt and that's seated absolutely perfectly both sides. So uh, it's not got any rattle, but it's seated on the floor. So 
that's perfect. I'll take it off one more time. And all I need to do now is to uh, sink just to a pilot hole, um, or a clearance, not a clearance hole, but a pilot hole into both pieces and sink a couple of screws so that uh, doesn't move in them slots. Okay, now that's secure. Um, I can put this back in place now and just scribe the top in. Okay, so we drop the top on. Standard stud wall, it's about a uh, three mil gap over the dis distance of this cabinet. So I'm just gonna set that back to the wall. Uh, grab a packer and my indelible pencil and just uh, run this along the wall to uh, give me a scribe line. Okay, so I'll nip outside and plane that in to the line and then see how it looks. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that as a scribe. It's probably half a mil proud at the front, but I'm going to leave that because Tulip's pretty uh, renowned for shrinking a little bit when it goes into a property anyway. Um, especially at the moisture you probably get it from the suppliers so I wouldn't have been bothered if it was a mil, maybe mil and a half or two mil proud at the front because it's a solid board I think that will shrink into place so uh, we'll just see what happens with it if it goes too much you can always take a bit off the cabinet and just drop it back to make it flush again but all I need to do now is uh, lift it back off and uh, screw that to the uh, cabinet from underneath There we have it, one bespoke matching radiator cover made and installed um, with lift off cleats so you've got uh, easy access to it and if ever I need to refinish it I can uh, take it back to the workshop, give it a good clean and uh, I can spray it as well. So uh, perfect solution to uh, radiator cover fitting is them uh, French cleats. Um, you've probably seen the ladder shelf in the background, if you've not seen that video then uh, have a look through my recent videos and uh, check it out.